Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Commander Clash podcast, where the Commander Clash crew discusses commander-related topics, and today we're going to be talking about how you can beat Blue in Commander. Uh, we talked about recently about how like two different archetypes in Commander that people dislike coming up across is usually Control and Combo, and Blue kind of ends up being associated with uh, stuff that people kind of get salty about. Blue is the color for counter magic and bounce and control. And those are things that uh, the average commander player, casual commander player um, struggles against. So we're going to go over kind of like, we're going to pinpoint what type of uh, cards and archetypes blue decks usually go up, uh, usually bring to the table, what people generally struggle with and ask about assistance for and then we're going to give in our insights on how to uh overcome those those issues in a game of commander both in terms of play style and specific card suggestions if you really need a little bit of extra oomph against a meta that is blue heavy and we also have uh uh, joining me for this discussion uh we have some some blue player uh experts actually we have the resident uh blue control player at the table <laughs> Saffron yes. Olive? No. <laughs> the worst. Can't it bring is. him anywhere. <laughs> He's always just like, I can't play a, a, a deck if it doesn't have Fierce Guardianship and at God. least eight other counter magic. I know. It's so miserable. Yeah. Oh. And by Seth, I meant the Asian Avenger, a.k.a. Krim. How's it going, Oh, Krim? hey, Misery's back on the menu. It's me. How you doing? <laughs> You're so dedicated to the color. Your 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 hair is even dyed uh, halfway there. Blue black, blue black, blue black. I mean, I like. I'm pretty much Demir all the time. Demir Dave. That's the new name. Watery Dave. Even if you would. So how, I mean, how you, you doing? You drop the red. Ah, well, you know, red always gets added somewhere. Along the way. <laughs> Sweet. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, we're we're actually doing something special at the very end. Since, since you are the resident blue control player at the table. Um, we're also going to have a little bit of a crim salt scale for some of the cards that we're going to be suggesting at the very end. So I'm so excited to see how tilted you get at the mere suggestion of some of these cards. (laughs) That's my secret cap. I'm always salty. (laughs) You just, you just spread the salt. You just hold a bucket of salt and you just spread it around the table. I'm just honestly always marinating in Morton's. So, you know. (laughs) Fantastic. And also joining me today is Saffron Olive, a.k.a. Seth. How's it going, Seth? I'm doing well, Tomer. How are you? Excited to um, <clears throat> talk about control decks, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm excited to divulge the secrets on beating beating Krim, <laughs> finally, in Commander. You can't keep getting away with it. <laughs> I mean, you just got to get more than hey. four lands. You'll probably be me. <laughs> Boom. Strip mine. Just strip mine the blue player. Strip easy. Mine <laughs> And also we have we have like a half blue player also feel like a Bruce Kitchen. I always associate you with the Simic player at the table. Yeah, so, I don't play which the is blue. Yeah, I don't play the controlling side of blue, so I wouldn't really okay. put me in this category here. But I do like me some card draw and yeah, extra turns, but not <laughs> in Commander. That's dirty. <laughs> No extra turns, but I think there are going to be some cards that some people or or your average like newer or casual player kind of struggles with that might be um, some cards you end up enjoying, like maybe a certain Blue Praetor, for example, (laughs) uh, has shown up in the past. Blatant we might have to I'm so, that. I don't understand how I'm the villain. Like, if it, like Phil, <laughs> Phil loves Jin, Risen Reef. <laughs> Come on! My, my, also, my, my secret is blue is by far my favorite color. Like, I will not play a 1v1 format without a blue deck. So, I'm kind of, I'm kind of there, but not on, not in Commander as much, I guess. I kind of, I wow. hide it. I hide it. Tomer, you're just too spiky. You're just too spiky, bro. <laughs> too spiky. You're too spiky. Like, if, if I can't play days in a one v one format, what's even the point? Honestly, <laughs> so am I Tomer the for life? Am I the least blue player then? Maybe I'm the least blue player out of all of us. If Tomer's a one v one blue player, it's funny yeah. because yeah. I think of your 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 blink deck is blue, like, but like you are the farthest thing from a blue player. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah, used to see you as a green color. player. Yeah, yeah I can, you I can need see to that. ramp heavy for your shenanigans. Usually, it, yeah. all, all my bad drifter. cards cost a lot of mana, so I need <laughs> yeah. I need the green. Yeah, yeah. You're more of a. I associate drifter, your so. color as rhino, actually. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's that's her rhino color. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, 
Um, so yeah, uh, we're going to be starting things off with first kind of like identifying what certain cards uh, people have issues with in blue. And I think, I think one of the, like the number one thing would probably be counter magic, right? Like, when whenever I see people saying they struggle against blue and commander, it's usually like, oh, I can't get through all the counter spells. Um, so what do you why, what do you guys think about that? Like as a as a complaint in commander, um, do you hear that often as well, or is there like other things in blue that people get more salty about? Well, I, I do hear that a lot. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I think that is it is often just the counter magic, the milling, and the theft, right? Like in the bouncing, those oh, are the four really? things. I think of, uh, and and yeah, like the the counter spells being the most prominent. So yeah, I I don't know. I mean, I I don't look at it any different than just a removal spell. So mm-hmm. if I'm like, it's a one for one spell. Mm-hmm. Eh, I mean, at the same time, like your Doom Blade isn't going to stop your Panermonicon or my Marari's yeah. Wake or my Planeswalker. Or so they're like counters are in some ways like supercharged removal spells like they are one for ones but the the flexibility i think kind of puts them on a different level in terms of gameplay like of course there's a timing restriction so that's a drawback you gotta have access to mana to cast them why the spells on the stack but the upside is you can deal with anything it's not like oh if i play my whatever non-creature this turn it might stick around or something so i think that's part of it Mm -hmm. i do think that counter spells are a big one and i think the reason they get so much hate from some players is just there's so many of them some of the other stuff like cyclonic rift there's only one cyclonic rift uh, even extra turn spells there's relatively few there's enough that you can put a bunch there's of them a in a deck lot. but counter yeah. spells mm-hmm. like every set has a counter spell they cost zero they're they're bulk a lot of them are bulk cards so anyone from a budget deck to a cdh deck can play as many counter spells as they can possibly fit into their deck so <laughs> i think that's part of why they're they're disliked is there's just many 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 of them mm-hmm. that that's that's true and if you want to go over if you want to like you'll be exposed to counter spells basically anytime you play against blue. Although I guess maybe on my streams or something, I guess on Magic Online you see it less often, just because that means you have to. It's more clunky to use online, but in paper it's much easier. Like you just you just have your your counter magic available. You don't have to say anything. You just wait until the moment <laughs> the, yeah, it's, to counter it off. Uh, the lazy way to play Moto is no counters, just so you can yeah. <laughs> f six through your opponent's turn. So I think it does actually have a little different meta there. <laughs> Um, actually, on that on that uh, point, though, Seth, you were mentioning uh, Cyclonic Rift and, and extra turns. Uh, we actually have like on EDH Rec, they have a salt scale, and I know you said um, you looked at it before. So, what are like some of the top blue cards uh, that people identify as salty on there? Maybe that can give us a better idea of what we're working for. Okay, so at the top of the blue salt list, number one is Stasis, uh, which obviously I don't, I've never seen anyone play Stasis, but it is a very salty card. Yeah. Then you got Expropriate uh, Sunder, which is five mana bounce all lands. Urza's on there, uh, the saltiest blue commander, Cyclonic Rift, Thassa's Oracle, Chingataxius Core Augur, uh, Rising Waters, another card that keeps you from untapping your lands, Narset that stops you from drawing cards, Time Stretch, Ristic Study, Back to Basics, and then you get into the free counter spells like Fierce Guardianship shows up on there. But really, if you're going to like boil this down to a few categories, I think you have counter spells you have extra turn spells you have stuff that keeps you from using your mana sunders and rising waters and stasis is and then stuff that keeps you from having cards in hand or drawing cards jingataxius narset essentially like if you were going to put it in one sentence people don't like blue because it's the color that's really good at stopping your deck from doing what it wants to do whether that be drawing cards <laughs> or having lands or resolving a spell or taking a turn blue is the color that gets to shut all that stuff down if it wants to the ultimate control color i guess the mo the color easiest at controlling the the board for sure um, and the stack so yeah, yeah the stack more than the board i think yeah that's true because it's the only color that can be like no to your to any instant or sorcery right like green can what do other color <laughs> how does how? how does green do that 
It has the uh, it has the the, the command. <laughs> it has uh, all the pr- like. I mean, I guess the stack being also like a uh, uh, veil of summer. It can kind of essentially counterspell you back. That, that just stops you, you, Grim. That just nah. stops you. My my Does pan- pan- is, the four mouths of hellfire. My Nobody's pan- gonna be like I veil of summer. <laughs> is it uh, is it not interacting with you on the stack? It's interacting with you on it's the stack. It's interacting with me on the stack. And I, it I interacts like... with the removal. A black <laughs> removal. Like, come on. Sure. Come on. Green is getting more but things. it's much more limited. Oh, like, it's more limited. I, it's more which limited which sure. stops the torment of Hellfire? Veil of Summer or a counter spell? Depends. Yeah. Does, counter does, spell. Does, does, veil of, or does torment of Hellfire target? It does not target. <laughs> oh, dang it's it. Each opponent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You just die. Like, yeah, and like the Fairy's Protection could counter, like, a so burn what you're spell saying to your here face, but... is you need a control player around to stop the Torment of Hailfire. No. Because I mean, what if you want to be the person who resolves the Torment of Oh, Hailfire, well, then, so. then, you know, you're, I think you're, you clearly can't be upset if it, that gets counterspelled. <laughs> I, I yeah. think from, like, the perspective of casual players in a casual format, it makes sense why Blue is, like, kind of disliked by a lot of players like if you really think about it it doesn't it make seem sense. like a stretch the, oh, that yeah. it's a color that's keeping me from doing all the fun things i want to do in a, in a whole bunch of different ways so i can see why like if you're coming from 60 card formats and you're used to you know, force wills and blood moons and stuff then it's probably not a big deal but if you're like not used to that and you're thinking oh, i'm gonna play this casual thing and cast my crawl worms and then you run into the blue deck that's like bouncing your stuff bouncing your lands countering all your stuff i I can see why that would make a certain type of player uh, a little bit salty. I could see why they'd be upset. Sure. <laughs> I think, I guess the, the, the harder thing to get over, I guess is like, yes, it makes, it makes a lot of sense that the, the color that stops people from doing their things um, is the one that gets hated out the most because it's the most obvious way of you not getting to play the game. But there's a more indirect way that is just as effective, if not more so, at stopping you playing the game. And that's just people winning the game super early. Like, let's say you are uh, you're an elf ball deck and you just create a hoof on turn six or something. If my deck hasn't really had a chance to do anything yet, then I effectively haven't had a chance to play the game, really. Like, I play some lands, I play some ramp, and then I died, and then the game is over, and we have to shuffle up and play again. But that doesn't that isn't associated in people's brains as much as a feel bad as it is the person who is just saying no to you uh, popping off or anything. Like it has the same result if both of you not playing the game, but one is uh, much more acceptable because I guess you get to shuffle up Im- immediately afterwards. And uh, I, but yeah, and I think like one is positive and one is negative, like. If you think about someone doing their thing and winning early, unjustly negative, like mm-hmm. if uh, essentially how you think of that is like, oh, I did my thing, they just did their thing more and they yeah. won, which is fine. Yeah, I think like psychologically, the like I didn't get to do my thing is a lot more painful for a lot of players than oh, they just did their thing better than I did my thing. I did mine, but I didn't do it good enough this time. Like that doesn't feel as bad as I didn't do my thing. Hmm. Yeah, and so you see like, that. You see that with Doomblade versus Counterspell. Like, most players are fine with yeah. you killing their creature on the battlefield, yeah. but if you cast an instant scatter and get it on the stack, a lot of players get salty about that. So I think there is, like, a big psychological aspect of this whole conversation. <laughs> yeah, that's what I wanted to mention as well. Like, for some reason, it doesn't really make sense, but just countering a creature, even without an ETB, is still feels worse than just destroying it right afterwards <laughs> i think it's just being said no to to your game plan and i kind of especially with new players i feel how they like build their deck and imagine what they're gonna do and then somebody says oh, no and that's yeah. that and usually control decks don't really win as fast so it also drags the game with even more nopes the better it is for the control player the more they say no and stuff the other players. So I, yeah, I get. I'm not. I mean, also, I play blue as well. Not too many yeah. counters. Just think of the the box know. topper force of will uh, flavor text. That's all you got to do. Just think that every time instead of no. Nope, what does it say? Amateur. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a fitting blue flavor text, actually. <laughs> That's literally all yeah. it says. Yeah. 
It is. It is. Like we're, we're focusing on ways to beat this, but it is interesting that the psychology is a big, big way of uh, understanding why uh, people dislike blue counter magic so much. And I think that actually, like knowing that it's more of a mentality thing, um, can actually help in terms of figuring out how to play properly against that. And we're gonna we're gonna touch upon that a little bit later in the podcast, but. Um, yeah, I just wanted people to like be aware that like um, even those two things have the same outcome. One can be one can be more salt inducing, and like this is just kind of human psychology, and it also leads to like game design too. Like I, I was gonna, I have like a wow analogy that that only a dozen of you will understand, but there was like <laughs> there was a cool like little roguelite dungeon that uh, World of Warcraft made one time, and the first version of it was basically. Uh, it would give you cumulative negative abilities on you that make the make it more challenging to run the dungeon through. Like one, like you just you couldn't stand still You're when about you had to stand right? still. No, it's um, it's uh, Torghast versus Visions of oh, oh, Nizoth. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Visions of Nizoth okay. people hated because it just gave you a lot of negative abilities to make the run harder. And the opposite of that, where they did it again the next time, was called Torghast, where it's the same idea. You run through a dungeon, and this time, what they did is they just gave you a lot of bonuses. You get stronger abilities as you go through it, but the actual dungeon itself was harder. So instead of punishing the player you're empowering the power the player the the challenge is the exact same either way but people liked being the ones who got to actively be powerful as opposed to being hampered by all these restrictions so it's just kind of like but the same result same result equally challenging dungeon same length or whatever like that but like, it's just human nature on 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 how to how to see that but uh, being aware of that i think is a is an important aspect to beating blue it's like yeah it feels bad but like as long as you're aware of uh that the end result is like the same um it, it kind of i think it helps a little bit maybe i'm just i mean actually let's let's just get it out of the way i am a miserable person it's because <laughs> I, I enjoy that stuff all right like when i was playing wow i loved keys the more th- uh, things like debuffs they stacked on i love yeah. the challenge so mate, you know what? I thought that was a blast. I love I, when I figured out how to play a Dark Souls game. Good lord, did I love failing for hours! <laughs> I love it. I love it in uh, Legacy. I got to play against a Legacy deck that was lands, and they had a Tabernacle of Pendril Veil. So upkeep, you have to pay one for each creature or sacrifice it. And they had a Sphere of Resistance, and it basically meant I could not cast spells. Mm-hmm. But I just I killed them with one. I just kept cool, and I'm like, I have one Delver on the battlefield. I'm nugging them for three each turn. They don't have an answer to it. As long as I'm holding up my answer to protect my Delver, I win the game. I'm not casting any spells on my turn. I'm just attacking and passing and saying go. And I won it, and it felt so good. <laughs> it felt so good. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it really depends on the situation. Um but bringing it back on topic, bringing it back on topic. Um, all right. Well, actually, no, this is the topic, actually. Solutions. So first, uh, so first, we've identified, like, what are the cards that get people salty? It's extra turns. It's stuff that says no and Cyclonic Rift. Um, so how would you approach someone um, who is struggling with these type of tactics? Like, what would you tell them in terms of, like, adjusting their play style? Is there anything you would do to alter your play style if you saw a blue control player at the table? Like, how would you play your deck differently? So, I know we joke about killing Krim first, but I actually think (laughs) that killing the control player first is, that's how you beat control. Like, how do you beat control is you're aggro, you pressure the control player, you get the control player low enough on life that they can't afford to just never tap out to play a blocker, never tap out to play a wrath. Like, that's that's what you do. It's not being, like, mean to Krim or whatever, but that's, if you just let the control player sit there and stay at 40 life and don't pressure them, they will win the late game. That's what that's the whole point of playing a control deck. Like, control has inevi- uh, inevitability, so you got to take the initiative. You have to be the one that's pressuring them and forcing the control player to not be able to just sit back and hold a handful of cards and counter what they want to and not counter. you got to make them actually make game actions and tap out during their turn and do things to stay alive. See, I, I, I think of it uh, that that is very true. First off, you do want to lower their health total. You want to get them at a low enough point to where... You can just essentially kill them at any any point, right? And you do want to make it so uh, the most prominent thing is a little bit like Seth would have mentioned. It is to make them tap out. So the way you do that is really to 
do the double plays, right? Like you make it so that you have bait to lure out the counter spell that's good enough to make them want to use a counter spell or removal spell. Because remember, control isn't just in blue. It's also in just like, like there is tap out control where I'm just hard removing everything, right? Like there, there is also that. So what you want to do is either A, you want to pressure them into tapping out and or using the removal, forcing their hand. You have to force their hand, and that means you can play two threats. You don't necessarily dump and go, oh, they're a control player, whatever. I'm going to commit all my threats onto the board and then wonder what happened when they swept the board, right? Like, you do just need to commit enough and not overcommit. And it seems kind of pretty basic, but, like, the when you think of it in theory, but when you actually put it down and look at it on paper, it is a lot harder to read the scenario than, than you would think. So how much is enough pressure, right? Now, of course, you can just have three people beat them up. Right, the one person. But remember, I will also say this with an asterisk: if the control player dies, it's the combo player is going off, or, or you know yeah. what I mean. So remember that there is a purpose for somebody that is playing control, and is to make it so that the game actually progresses and goes on before the combo gets there. It progresses in a weird, like, like sadistic <laughs> way. But, like, like yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, I, I do think, though, it is very important to do the double plays, constantly make moves that force them to use their, like, resources. Yeah, and I, I don't think you have to actually kill the control player, but I think there's a lot of value to getting them low enough on life that they're uncomfortable and have to make plays they otherwise might not want to make like use their removal tap out during their turn so i'm not saying you just gotta like every time you play against the control deck everyone like arch enemy take them out and then proceed with the game like you don't gotta do that but i do think you need to focus on like getting them out of their comfort zone and getting their life total down to a place where they can't just sit back and uh, do whatever they want all game Mm -hmm. so uh, how would you approach a control player at the table Krim, how do you approach Krim at the table? <laughs> yeah, so the thing is, even if they, like, late in the game, yeah, we you should definitely have done something about the control player. Like, if they leave 10 mana untapped, it's very bad. But in the early to mid game, they can pretty much only counter one spell each rotation. So maybe speak with your the other people at the table maybe bait or something like they can it's actually pretty easy to do something impactful if you just time it correctly like i feel like you most of the time you're just super scared that maybe crim has the opposition agent so you don't do it but oh does he also have the counter so you <laughs> you gotta play around one of those you can't say oh they might have a counter and an opposition agent so i'm just gonna not crack my fetch and not play my spell uh so sometimes you just gotta embrace that if they have it they have it maybe you know, the next player in line just does something about it they can't have it every time feels dumb if they have it but i mean that's but also have a you, backup maybe. plan if they do right because you, you yeah. need to be able like if it if like this is sure. my win con i'm just and, oh like, yeah this is my Don't, own yeah, out, like, yeah. yeah. exactly yeah, you should definitely not run out your win con into the open mana, but if you played something and they countered it, so the next player might run out their win con, and I guess that's also bad for you, but it's also bad for the control player. I don't know, there's mm-hmm. no, I'm not rooting for anybody <clears throat> at the table here, I'm just saying how to beat. Yeah. Like, don't be too scared of control. Uh, yeah, don't play around everything. <laughs> yeah, but they might have it sometimes, often. Don't play... Don't play too scared, but, like, I totally agree with that. Like, you, you can't play too... You can't just, like, pass and not do anything. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you, you do want to bait out the counter magic. And, like, if you think they have something, like, just don't play your most important card. Run out the other cards that might be able to apply some pressure and and see if that sticks. And eventually, like, yeah, you don't get to cast your game-winning spell or your combo or whatever... Uh, you have to delay that. But if you can just like throw a couple creatures on the battlefield, um, get a little bit of value, maybe pressure them with your board a little bit, like eventually they're just going to die with whole, clutching a bunch of counter magic. And I think that's like the best way of going. I, I have a recent example on Commander Clash. I was playing Golgari Artifacts and I was just casting my Ik to Kik uh, over and over again um, <laughs> because even when he was like nine mana, uh, because 
I knew that would get a response out of the table. And what I had in my hand was I had really powerful cards. I had a Mystic Forge in my hand, which is one of the best cards in my deck. It was like a massive card advantage engine. And I could not afford to have that countered because that if that was countered, that was my way to like like have card advantage throughout the game. And I needed that to, to be on the battlefield. And I needed that to stick around. Um, so I just kept running out eek to keek. Not even Armix. Armix is like 10 times better too because Armix is like repeatable creature removal. So if you play like your commander or anything, I'm just going to keep gunning it down. I didn't even play Armix. I just played eek to keek over and over again. And it just got a lot of counters and removal and everything like that. And I was still casting a spell. I was still putting a, something on the board. Uh, but I wasn't just running out my best cards into open mana because it felt that felt like it would be a waste like i feel like if i just cast mystic forge instead i would have it would have been countered i'd be in a very bad position and so i I think that's how you run it and i think it's also like in commander in specific your commander you can cast a whole bunch of times so you have Mm -hmm. this one spell that you have the ability to like keep casting and if it's strong enough that they have to deal with it it's a way to keep getting the answers out of the control player's hand i think I'm also a big fan of uh, goading someone else into casting spells and then goading the control player into countering those spells. That's my main (laughs) technique on Commander class. Just like, like, you know, Kim's got a counter. Like, oh, Krim, you gotta gotta get that. You gotta get that. Tomer's gonna resolve his commander. We can't have that. And then then it's my turn. I'm like, oh, okay, sweet. I get to resolve my stuff. So, (laughs) the politics. I've definitely picked up on Seth's, like, like subtle goading. I'm like, no, 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 no. Nice try. That's a Richard technique. That's where I learned it. That's how I I learned it because like Richard on that constantly one. goes <laughs> every time. He's like, "Oh my god, he played like us." Like, uh, is it significant? Krim. There's <laughs> always there's always that one player that isn't control like in paper, but is actually the control player. That's Richard, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. like I yeah. am pa- control in like paper. Like, yes, the cards the, I play, but he's Richard the mastermind yeah. control. <laughs> Yeah, Richard uh, often says, like, something hits the board, and he just said, so we're dead, right? So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just yeah, yeah. getting some fear into everyone would the one time mean I anything, called but... The one time I called Richard on, on it, I was like, no, 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 Richard, you're not going to get me with your weird control bluff. I, <laughs> he actually didn't have it, and then we lost the game. So. <laughs> I think it's... Yeah, uh, I, uh, yeah. Also important to know that doing nothing is a really bad plan because in general the control deck is going to benefit more from you not doing anything than you are. So I think mm-hmm. it's easy to be too scared of the control deck, and you kind of hit on this earlier. But don't just do nothing and expect it to get better because that's not how it works against control. It, get, it gets worse turn by turn where you do nothing. Like they're going to benefit from that a lot more than you are. Yeah, controls are inherently late game decks. I think also another nice thing to have though is like. You always want to pressure control so they actually do have to, you know, use resources to try and and deal with the board instead of like draw cards or or, or tutor up whatever they need. But also, like like Seth said, you don't have to necessarily kill them because like if you're playing against a control deck and a combo deck, if you know that you can't stop the opponents, uh, the opponent from comboing off, then it's good to kind of like pressure both those players about equally, and then. You know, maybe try and take out the combo player first before you finish off the control deck. Because, like, if you know that you don't have an answer to the the combo deck's finisher, if it's, like, based on instants and sorceries that your deck just can't uh, interact with profitably, um, then you might need the, co- you might need the con- control player around to, to keep the combo player from popping off. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, there are definitely situations where the counter spells or the sweeper or whatever is actually like helping you rather than mm-hmm. hurting you. So I think it's important to to also keep that in mind for sure. Especially when it like with the way cards are now, including like creatures, some of them just can't resolve. Like all, they, they just cannot resolve because they do something as soon as they hit the board. Right. Uh, like so you do need them to be dealt with on the stack. So. Mm hmm. Okay, so we covered about we covered play style, uh, like ways of looking at the game when you're actually sitting at, across from a blue control deck or a blue, just like a popular blue deck. Um, but now we get to the the super fun part about the podcast, and we're going to suggest some cards that might give you a little bit of an extra extra leg up against the most 
common salty blue cards that you'll see often at a table and these will kind of help you um help you help you deal with with blue in particular while not being like so specific that like they're unplayable otherwise like these are kind of just cards good cards that you should be adding and they're extra useful you know in a a blue heavy meta so Seth, what do you got for us here? And we're going to we're going to determine how good these cards are by how salty Krim gets <laughs> at these. So we're going to be we're it's going like to be ranking five? it out of five salty Krim faces. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> five salty Krims. Okay. Uh, so Seth, <laughs> so, right. so, so 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 Seth, what do you got for us? Number one, we got we got a an easy one, a simple one that we see quite a bit, which is Veil of Summer. Six. Veil of Summer. One mana. <laughs> <laughs> it's a one mana instant. It says, draw a card if your opponent has cast a blue or black spell this turn. Spells you control can't be countered this turn. You and permanents you control gain hexproof from blue and black until end of turn. Uh, so essentially a one mana cantrip that against blue is mostly keeping your stuff from getting countered. I guess maybe it could fizzle a removal spell at Pongify or something in some situations. But really it's one mana Either your control opponent needs to counter the Veil of Summer, or if they don't counter, and then the counter is out of their hand, hopefully, or if they don't counter the Veil of Summer, then they don't have the option to interact with your spells on the stack for the rest of the turn, essentially. I, th- I think this card is immediately a six for me. Six out of salty, like six <laughs> out of five salty crims, because it does everything you want, right, for against a control deck. A, it's cheap. It's one mana. And, and it does 19 things for one mana. Right, it's a set, <laughs> like counter spells. Like the way you beat them, we had mentioned, is a game of attrition. You run them out of resources. Right, this not only is juicing them of their cards, but it's also refilling it. It's replacing itself, and it's doing it all for one mana. Of course, as the years move forward, things aren't exactly counter spells anymore. We just had divide by zero, banned in standard. It's now bouncing things off the stack. Which is a way around uncounterable. So it, it's this weird little like mini game within itself. But majority of things Blue is doing is trying to counter you. So this card shuts it all down for the rest of the turn and gives you one big window. So yeah, no, this is a six out of five. I hate it. It's miserable. I I know I said misery's back on the menu, and and, and this is also <laughs> this is the other thing on the menu. Okay, like to go alongside me, misery. And the nice thing about it is the floor is pretty high. Like there's anti-blue cards that are just way too narrow like boil destroy all islands i gotcha that's great if you're up against a blue mono blue deck but it does nothing in some pods veil of summer it hits on black it hits on blue so the odds of this doing nothing in a random pod is pretty low i would say in worst case even if you're like not super worried about counters wait until someone casts a blue or black spell and you can just snap this off as a one mana cantrip and get a new card so the the floor is like high enough that i think you can just jam this in essentially any deck even in like a random in the dark pod i would say unfortunately yeah (laughs) yeah unfortunately that is true yeah i always get a bit jealous when i see it in main decks i guess or like blind blindly putting it into your commander deck i never did it but it's usually somebody is playing black or blue i mean it's the colors i play the most i guess looking at the stats um but yeah i think it's just it's always gonna get you some value and if not i mean the the ceiling is so so high i don't know why they made it cost one mana but it's like the by far best card against control like it it just does it all i don't know not, the, not the just ceiling control. is just so high just anything in those colors. Any anything blue black, yeah. Yeah, blue and black. Yeah, it, it's just it stops counter magic, it stops Pongify, rapid hybridization, any of the black uh removal spells like Snuff Out, Doom Blade or whatever. And and it also gives you hex proof, so any like targeted like it's like a cruel ultimatum decks. type thing. <laughs> it stops that. Yeah, some yeah, like, tendrils, storm kill, it would fizzle that. Yeah. Yeah. No blade and thievery. You can't oh. blade and thievery the person because <laughs> oh. you you're hex proof, so you can't oh, target. God. Seven yeah, mana gets dunked Oko. on by one. No, no <laughs> agent and treachery for a turn. No, and then it's like the rest cool. of the turn is like if you want if you're a combo deck. And you just cast this, and you either have you either, you're eating up an, oppo- an opponent's counter for one one green, or you just get to, it resolves, and then you just get the combo off and win. 
Uh, I think the only downside for this card is that it is seven dollars because it's so good. So I will mention there's there's the budget version of it that is not at very much not as good. But if you really need to protection against counter magic, it is I think acceptable. It's Autumn's Veil, which is the original version of this card. Uh, green instant, same cost, same instant speed. Spells you control can't be countered by blue or black spells this turn. And creatures you control can't be the targets of blue or black spells this turn. So it protects against uh, counter magic. It protects against targeted removal. But it doesn't protect all your permanents. It only protects creatures. Um, it doesn't draw you a card. So it's, it's I... lesser hexproof. And it doesn't draw you a card. So, But it's, it's, it's 40 cents. So I, if you it's really need... Cents. <clears throat> But but yeah. this it's like a zero on the salt scale. Yeah. I, yeah. I, 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 I'm not even upset. Fair. It's 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 so it doesn't replace itself. It doesn't. It's 2011 magic. Yeah, that's it, why it, it, it's trash. And when it came out, no, no, it wasn't good. I I beat it all yeah. the time. People are like ah, control opponent. I'm sideboarding four of these in. I'm like okay, sure. <laughs> yeah, because but, you're one for oneing. And it's yeah, like a... you're actually like not really doing much right so because you're not replacing it, it like like it doesn't replace itself which is you're kind of huge like, you're like two for wanting yourself to resolve something basically so your thing has to be really good if you're gonna like right waste another yeah. card to get it to resolve uh, so yeah, and, yeah. I, I don't know if i'd even play that in budget decks honestly i feel like maybe we'll yeah, come across some fair. better like i, I don't know i don't want to like totally uh dismiss it but Hopefully we come on some better budget options as we go through this because I really I'm don't like I'm looking at the Autumn's list and <laughs> I'm looking at the list and there ain't much. Uh, I guess a lot, of, a lot of these cards are expensive, aren't they? That's because everyone people really wants so much. <laughs> people really, yeah. yeah. They're willing to pay <laughs> to dunk on yeah. Krim. <laughs> okay, yeah. I, just wanted, I wanted to leave it as, a, as an option, but yeah. yes, it is significantly worse. The problem that it doesn't protect you or your like non-creature things is big. It's that is and legitimately huge, yeah, and it, and of course it doesn't draw a card, which we had mentioned, but it oh. only hitting creatures is very, very much so a like if if Veil of Summer's S, this is like D to like mm-hmm. C minus. Yeah. There's All also right. Overmaster, right? For one red, you could that draws a card at least, doesn't it? Prevent countering Overmaster, the next instant but... or sorcery you cast. This exactly, can't be countered. It's only so it's a sorcery. sorcery. It's a yeah. sorcery though. That's rough. Yeah, I well, it's still your eleven box. I got a playset of these laying around. That one, Ooh. that well, one sees some legacy play. I think that's out. that's why that actually shows up in like some legacy decks. <sighs> I mean, and I guess why we're on the topic, maybe we should just throw in the other uncounterable stuff. Uh, Cavern of Souls, really expensive. And Besage you uh, is like Cavern of Souls, but for instant or sorceries on a land. But yep. they're like they're also both really expensive, <clears throat> but they're similar to Veil of Summer. Like if your goal is my thing's not going to be countered by the control player, they kind of they kind of do that, right? Like Cavern for All creatures, right. Besage you for spells. Am I getting too far ahead of ourselves? To if we're jumping into it, I want to explain what the cards are just more thoroughly. So Cavern of Souls, um, it's a land that enters the battlefield untapped. It's attached for one colorless. Um, and when you enter it, choose a creature type and you can, you can tap it for colors or you can tap for one man of any color, but you can only spend it to cast a creature spell of the chosen type and that spell can't be countered. So if you're a tribal deck, this card is like an auto include if you can afford it. It's like $60, so it's quite expensive, but Just like reprinted. Yeah, it just got reprinted at Mythic. Wow. <laughs> In like the $80 per pack, uh, set. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> Reprint there, Wizards of the Coast. Uh, great job there. Um, so I, I think it, also the the uh, cost the the cost to run it, not the cost to run it. The financial cost is very high, but like the the uh, risk versus reward of running it, it's a land. It's going to tap for colorless. It comes into play untapped. That's not the worst. Yeah. And then all your tribal creatures are going to just be uncounterable. Krim, what do you think about this on salt scale? So cavern, actually, like is I think roughly about a, about a three for me, three out of five because assaults. it does come attached to a land and that can mess you up because like okay I it, it's weird right it only adds the color for the tribal type now I myself think it's it's a very good card it's obviously very good if your commander is what you care about then this is all you got to this is what you want right so. I think it's definitely got its applications. Uh, it, it's a solid card, but I don't know if it's... 
I, I, I'm not necessarily like super crying if I see this, right? So mm. uh, it it does hurt though. It does hurt. Uh, like it's an average amount of pain. So three out of five on the salt scale. Okay, three out of five. What do you all? Th- what do you think about Boseju then? This one is a little bit different. Well, a lot different. It's uh, Boseju who sells all legendary land and his battlefield tapped. And you can tap it, pay two life, and add one colorless mana. If that mana is spent on an instant or sorcery spell, that spell can't be countered. So you don't have to be locked into a certain tribe, but it enters the battlefield tapped, and it can only tap one way. You're always going to lose two life. It's always going to be colorless. It's never going to tap for colored. And uh, if it's an instant or sorcery, it can't be countered. I, I think this is, like, lower. I think it's about a two on the salt scale. Two? It's it's good for if you are trying to resolve exactly your one or, like, like big game-winning instant or sorcery, your insurrection, your rise of the dark realms, whatever, right? But otherwise, it's not helping you cast your creatures. <laughs> it's, it's not helping you cast your non-instants and sorceries. So it's nice in the right deck. Like, it, it can be, like, a four or something like that in the right deck but on average i feel like for how much this costs this is actually not good enough i feel mm. like besides you i would i wouldn't just play in any deck that has spells like i don't think yeah. if you're playing a random deck and you have some instant or sorceries i wouldn't run it on the other hand if you're planning on winning with a specific spell or a big exsanguinate or torment a hailfire or something like that then this is like going to be one of the most important cards in your deck because eventually yeah. you find it and play it and you don't want to spend all your mana on a torment hailfire only to have someone force a will it or something it's just so so brutal when that happens right and this is a really good way around it so i think it's a card i wouldn't just jam in most decks but in the right deck i think it's it's pretty powerful if you're resolving that finisher or combo piece or whatever it's like the best card it's the most important yeah if, if your finisher is an instant or sorcery this is like the best land because yeah. it's like it. the best yeah. card in my Tashira deck. Like I win with a Torment of Hailfire or an Exsanguinate. So if I see a blue player at the table, I tutor this up first, and then the next turn I try to win with an Exsanguinate and a Torment. And it's about to tap though. That kind of sucks. And, and it yeah, is painful. Fun. Like you, it can have mana for anything, but two life per one mana is whew, that adds up if you have this early in the game. That's another drawback. You don't want this to be your turn one land drop yeah. or whatever. Oh yeah, it's like an ancient tomb without any of the the upside. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> basically. <laughs> Yeah. It's great in Spell Slinger, and I, I, I feel like I don't, I wouldn't play it anywhere else, really. Like, yeah. even, I don't know, even even if you are trying to win with Torment of Hailfire, like, and that's your only spell, do you, like, would you, would you play this? I like, mean, what about it? It's, it's, what's that? It's like your, your main only spell. spell. Eh, right, I mean, right. Yeah, I don't know. If that's what you're trying to do, like, if your goal is to win with Torment Hailfire, yes, I'll play it. If you just are, like, sure. some yeah. black deck and you have happen to have Torment because you like it, then I can take it or leave it. Although it is a little better right. in black because of uh, Urborg, actually. that It yeah. reduces a mm-hmm. huge amount of that's drawback true. if you're a black deck. Yeah. yeah. Or, like, Genesis okay. Wave. If you're trying to Genesis Wave, like, you just don't want to spend 20 yes. mana on a spell, only have it get countered, so. <laughs> that has to be your finisher. Yeah. Like, if you have a finisher that's worth it at instant sorcery, this becomes really good, but otherwise I would avoid it. Um, too too painful otherwise. Uh, but moving on from uncounter, like, making your stuff uncounterable. Phil, what do you got for us here? Oh, I'm still sticking with something that can't be counted. Well, it doesn't uh, make other stuff uncounterable, is what I meant. Yeah. So my pick is Toski Bearer of Secrets, um, honorary skeleton and bear and everything Bird. else. Bird. Uh, it is a scroll <laughs> though. It's a four mana one one indestructible can't be countered. And these are ah, the other lines are pretty relevant against control too. Attacks each turn, each combat if able. That's not good. But whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. So this usually single-handedly puts you ahead against control because they can count it, they can destroy it, which is usually not a blue thing. Uh, and then when your creatures connect, you draw a card, so you get... Co- it's everything you want. It's card advantage. They can't do anything about it. Just a pretty... pretty. I mean, it's a very solid card just in general, but especially against control. I usually sideboard it in if I play a creature deck in even in 60 cards uh, decks against control because sometimes they get sometimes they lose against a single toski but that's one we want but mm-hmm. i would play it w- with other creatures of course 
But man, that's it. Body control decks. It's uh, <laughs> remake one. I think I, I put you- Toski. I think it probably about a four to like a five on the salt scale. Yeah. Toski is like really good because again, <laughs> what we like, what you want to do is you want to run them at like the control player wants to run you out of cards. This is not this is not going well for their game plan, right? You are now <laughs> you are now refilling your hand. You you just, you know it's going to resolve. So the only thing that's nice is that recently control has had a lot of things that exile creatures, which is the only thing that stops this card right but if you slap like boots or something <laughs> squirrels with the shoes you know like it's this card does everything uh, like this is a control player's nightmare if you are in a go wide deck and you have multiple like your little land of war elves your little one one like things that don't matter just became an avengers level threat because now every single <laughs> one of them is going to draw you cards i'm like I, I don't care if you hit me for 10 with one thing yeah. right I, I care that you drew a card off that thing that hit me for 10 right like that's what i care about so I think this is like pretty high up there in the in like the token decks, the go wide decks, anything that's got a lot of creatures. This is a house. I guess that's also a good point to mention in terms of like ways of thinking about how to beat control decks. If they're focusing on counter magic, they're trying to one for one you to death. So if you do just draw more cards in them, you can just keep one for oneing all of their counter magic all day long because you have more cards. So as long as you get stuff sticking around, maybe it's not the the best card you want to stick around. But if you just drop a lot of threats, like the control player will not be able to one for one of you anymore, and they have to start relying on the board wipes. Right. So Tapping they have to have out. both. It's yeah. indestructible, though. It's like yeah, the indestructible. It and if you're just drawing more cards than their board wipes and their counter magic, then you you're gonna win. You're gonna overwhelm them. So card draw like it's very good against control <laughs> i i think that's why it's the best can be countered creature i know people like yeah. like to talk about whatever carnage tyrant or cards like that and i actually think that they're not very good against control in commander i mean they're you're gonna get them to resolve but the problem with a lot of those cards is they still just get wrath or they still just get edict yeah. like it's not a guarantee mm-hmm. toski like has an extra layer of protection where it's indestructible as well which mm, requires specific answers to actually uh, to actually deal with it. So I think if you're going to go with one can't be countered creature, as long as you got a reasonable number of creatures in your deck, I think Toski is definitely the way to go compared to the other options. Like I, yeah. I, I, It's not a threat itself. It's just the card draw is so right. good. Yeah. It gets you gets you over one for one in the control player. Yep. It's it's really like the attacks every turn that just gets me every time, you know? That that all oh, oh, wow. <laughs> no, like like legitimately this, the, like the, I know I, I hated Carnage Tyrant in 60 card, right? Because at the time, yeah. that card was a house, right? But yeah. the difference here is, which, by the way, power power creep. Uh, the difference here is that this just is way better because you can maybe answer it, edict them. And like I, I will say Gaia's Revenge, having haste is scary, but not great in Commander. So Seth has a great point. Those things, just because it says uncounterable, isn't exactly great. It, and- it has tons of ways to die. And there's a huge difference between 20 life and 40 life. Like, Carnage Tyrant right. in 60 card formats, that's like, control player, you gotta kill this somehow in three turns. In Commander, right. it's like, you gotta kill this in the next six turns or something, <laughs> and you're definitely gonna find a Wrath before my Carnage Tyrant goes all the way, so, or most of the time. So I think that's the other, like, big difference that makes those cards a lot scarier in 1v1 formats. And the cost, right? Like, Carnage Tyrant's six mana, Chandra's, like, you know, like, like all these cards are, like, five plus mana, right? This actually comes down relatively early uh, at four mana. So, it is very good for what it costs. Hmm. Okay. I'm going to move on from Counter Magic for a second. I'm going to talk about one of the big boogeymans of the format, for, for casual tables at least. It's Cyclonic Rift. It's one of the most played blue cards uh, in the format, it's easily splashable. So odds are, if you're up against a table, odds are one of the decks is going to have Cyclonic Rift in, in their decks. So you're going to be seeing it very, very often. And the problem with Cyclonic Rift for a lot of decks is it gets around a lot of the conventional protection spells. So if you have any sort of permanence, uh, you can give your permanence hexproof. You can give your permanence indestructible. Cyclonic Rift gets around all of that because it's just bouncing and it doesn't target. So... Um, I think there, I present to you, uh, Krim, uh, two ways of dealing with uh, uh, Cyclonic Rift the most efficiently. Uh, the number one way, I will say, is Teferi's Protection. 
uh, three mana instant until end of turn your life total can't change and you gain protection from everything all permanents you control phase out so when they're phased out they're not on the battlefield anymore they're treated as outside of the they're not in the game um so that means when your cyclonic curve resolves none of your permanents are bounced actually they all remain on the on the battlefield and then on your turn they phase back in and you can immediately attack or whatever and also it has the added benefit is somebody's using uh cyclonic rift aggressively um your life total can't change so they can't swing at you for lethal on that turn either uh so i had that but then i had i i know this is kind of expensive and we all talked about in, in the past how the fierce protection is so good so i also present to you a spicy choice which i think is a little bit underrated guard uh Teferi's protection 21 dollars. so like either just yeah i think it's it's a, a staple worth buying or just proxy or whatever but this one is like a dollar fifty right now. This is Guardian of Faith. Guardian of Faith, three mana, Spirit Knight, Flash Vigilance for a three two, and when it enters the battlefield, any number of target creatures you control phase out. So you can use this to protect your creatures from any sort of removal spell, but it also phases them out, so it works against Cyclonic Rift. So what happens is, if you want to protect all your creatures from being bounced, you can cast Guardian of Faith. Same cost as Teferi's Protection. Uh, the Guardian Faith will phase out all the creatures. And then Guardian Faith is the only creature that will be bounced back. So you get to reuse that card later on and phase out your creatures for additional protection. Your It doesn't protect uh, your non-creature permanents from being bounced. So they will still get bounced. And if you're being attacked for lethal on Cyclonic Rift, you're still going to die. But if it's just like a value end of turn Cyclonic Rift type thing... This can uh, keep your board state nice and healthy, especially for token decks. Like, you know, if your tokens go away, they're, they're gone forever. So what do you think about these, Krim? How, how, how salty do you get if you're resolving a Cyclonic Rift and this happens? I think these cards are probably some of the best ways to fight a control deck because, and for you personally, so I think this is like pretty high up there. I think this is about a four. Uh, depending on the board wipe, Guardian of Faith, another card I'm glad you brought up because that card is great in a creature deck. For exactly that reason there, it is something that you can, if you play against a Cyclonic Rift, you can phase it out, get it back into your hand, use it again, right? But but Teferi's Protection is amazing because it protects everything and it also makes it so that you benefit from my board wipes right so my board wipes just helped you get into a better position if you're the player casting the teferi's protection the guardian of faith you love it you just i essentially just helped you you used me as your minion to clear the board for you so these cards are like four on the salt scale to like a, like almost a five at times especially teferi's protection when it it's able like maybe i'm trying to like win by getting to, like, kill you now, right? Like, all right, I'm going to bounce everything and then kill you. Well, Teferi's Protection keeps you around, no matter what. So it is so hard to get around that without countering it. And you just spent seven mana on Cyclonic Rift, so right, odds right. are you probably don't have any extra mana to right. counter as well. I think uh, okay. also worth probably shouting out, like, uh, Lizelle's Acrobatics, Ghostway, other, like, exile all your stuff, return end of turn. Like, Ghostway's three mm. mana, instant. Remove each creature you control from the game. Return those creatures to play under their owner's control at the end of turn. Essentially, does uh, Lizelle's Acrobatics, is that with a twist? Eerie and Erlude, is that with a twist? Essentially all the same thing. But those are other ways that you can kind of do the same thing as Guardian of Faith. Uh, the biggest difference is phasing in will come back in at the beginning of your turn. Uh, mm -hmm. when these will come back in at the end of the turn. The upside is these cards will trigger ETBs uh, because phasing isn't technically removing the creatures and putting them back into play. So I think in some de in most decks, I think Guardian of Faith is probably better. But if you're a deck that's built around ETB triggers and doing shen blink shenanigans like I love, then I think that these are actually just like accidentally good Cyclonic Rift or reasonable Cyclonic Rift protection too. Yeah, I agree. And also Guardian of Faith is also an ETB, so like if you only have one blink mm -hmm. effect in your hand, you know, just blink the Guardian of Faith and you just save the rest too, so And I guess that's, that's uh, kinda nice. Why we're talking about Cyclonic Rift, maybe this is cheating, but play your own counters. Like I think if you happen to have <laughs> blue mana in your deck, even if you don't want to be a control deck, Toss a negate in there. Toss a Dovin's veto in there. Toss a uh, one counter. Like if I'm, pl I don't play control decks really. Even though I play blue, I don't really play control decks for the most part. But if you look at my deck list, every deck is going to have like one or two counters, just because they are like a super easy way to answer that Cyclonic Rift or something like that, which uh, is very hard to do. So, 
So, Seth, would you say then, like, if you're, like, let's say a creature-based deck that has blue and wants to play its commander, that you'd really like a fierce guardianship? Because oh, just, just yeah. say it. Just say it. Yeah, just say it. Just say it, Seth. Yes, I agree. This is only free once the is. commander is on the battlefield. Yeah, yeah. It is, yeah, sure. it is very It is very good. It is. I just don't like that card for other reasons, but it is a really good way to uh, to protect your stuff, for sure. So you, yeah, okay. Cool, cool, cool. I just, it's, you know. it's good, but it's a, it's a good design. I would, yes, I would it's say. great design. <laughs> yeah. Free counter magic. What good design. Totally can it's play around free that. when you just cast it. That's also the problem. It's not even bad as a negate. <laughs> ah, see, I'm already Anyways. getting salty about blue. <laughs> oh my god, already, <laughs> already. <laughs> well, the blue in me is. Uh, I'm feeling conflicted here. Um, all right, moving on though, Phil. I see you have something that is, is so spicy. Oh jeez, uh, I yeah. just can't wait. <laughs> Yeah, these kind of break the limitation of cards that are only only good against blue, but I kind of wanted to just say them. In case you you get tormented by a like all blue play group or something, you might consider the cards Sea Time or Boil. Boil just destroys all islands. Everybody will love this. <laughs> and Sea Time is actually something I am... Um, kind of wanting to try out it's uh, see let me just get the oracle text here mm -hmm. it's pretty 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 easy one though it's, so it's kind of expensive super oh, expensive yeah? what, what does it cost in paper like 20, it's 18 dollars oh in paper lord what when it works people people hate blue i don't <laughs> people hate blue yeah. trust me <laughs> so let's read the card it's two mana one and a green instant Play C time only during your turn. Take an extra turn after this one if an opponent played a blue spell this turn. So it's a time walk. If you um if your opponent tried to counter something, it's a super Two situational. A or blue. Yeah, I'm just gonna blue get anything trim with this. At all. Anything blue. Yeah. Anything Nothing's blue. It's gonna stop. It's not just a counter. But it has yeah, to be during yeah. your. It does have to be during your turn. turn. So, yeah. so. It has to be your turn. So, like, if somebody pongifies any of your things, you're like, you activated my <laughs> trap. <laughs> well, I'm gonna get grim with this. Like, as much 100%. as I hate not playing fetch lands because of agent of treachery, at least I'm gonna pull off a sea time, and it's gonna be glorious. And if I never you... do it, at least maybe Krim is scared of it. That's could you that imagine? <laughs> Can you imagine you cast a spell, Krim counters it, you veil of summer it, and oh, then you cast seed time? That's like a that's oh. a oh, 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 oh. that's a big sad. That's a big sad. Oh my god, that's oh a big sad. Oh my god, I need it. Krim, what do you rate seed time and boil? So boil actually is like not on the salt scale. Because as as magic has continued to progress, my mana base isn't actually islands anymore, right? <laughs> yeah, like it's probably. It, it's like all these like drowned catacombs and things like that, right? So it doesn't hit as uh, unless you have a way to turn everything into an island. Uh, but like yeah, like the this just doesn't that doesn't hit anymore. Um, I will say like like I like this includes like cards like choke. Um, in commander where everything is singleton, if maybe if this were 60 card format, then yeah, choke hits harder because I'm playing four watery graves or something like that. And most control blue based control decks will have a multiple islands. But in commander, there's so many singletons that boil choke. These things just don't do it anymore. However, <laughs> seed time okay well or run more basics and then get got by by choke and boil right like sure i'd rather get cho uh, choked than bo uh blood moons so know. you'd rather get choked out I okay all right all right, yeah. all right. dang dude that this is a tomer back-to-back podcast spicy things tomer saying <laughs> what Woo! no come on <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know what I mean. <laughs> At least I don't have the big black mic in the frame anymore. Yeah. <laughs> sit back upright. <laughs> back to uh, we'll, we'll time. Focus on Anyways, boils, back right? to sea we'll time. Uh, so yeah, sea <laughs> time you know, on the other hand. <laughs> Sea time is a bit tricky because it's because of the <laughs> the uh, part of only on your turn. If the spell you cast isn't deemed good enough. I'm not going to play anything, right? So you do have to walk the line of, like, this This essentially is a card that has suspend, like, 30. If you're trying to, like, resolve your, your end game spell, right? Like, ha-ha-ha, you're going to want to counter my Torment of Hailfire, so I've now 
wait like <laughs> waited this long to do this. Oh right? yeah. So so it, it's weird. Like there's if you just take an extra turn early, it kind of doesn't do anything, right? You've just kind of essentially ramped, which I assumed you're already doing in this color. So this could just be a rampant growth, and it has to be well timed. So I think this is pricier than it should be because it's just like a two to three on the salt scale for me because it, it does just kind of serve as a, a ramp effect, which I do hate. So I guess it's salty for other reasons, <laughs> but, but like, you know what I mean? Like it, it's not like a veil of summer. It's not forcing yeah. your spell through. It's not forcing your, your win con through. It's just giving you another turn. And this at oft, oftentimes could just be a dead card or kind of like a meh card in your hand. I don't know. Oh, it's certainly often a dead card. Even if your opponent play blue, it's not guaranteed. I guess I, I haven't played it yet or tried it yet. I haven't had it in one deck so far. Right. But I s expect it to work best if you are next to the blue player, last in line. So when they cast their Sphinx's Revelation or something end of the turn, mm. then you can snap it off. That might probably be the most likely scenario to put it yeah, off. Yeah. It's just hilarious if it works and i'm gonna do yeah. it but i wouldn't say oh, yeah. hey play this against blue play a toski first or like a cavern of souls it's not yeah, proactive not, against blue it's just a insane gotcha if you put yeah, it off it's a i love gotcha cards so yeah i, oh, I yeah. do think this card is hilarious i love this gotcha is my cards. favorite card from the entire <laughs> list like the meme yeah. potential on this is skyrocketing. <laughs> just think of the entertainment <clears throat> value here you just have to if scream I what time yeah. is it before you cast the seed time. <laughs> what time is oh, it? Well. Seed time. <laughs> Just like, I want the the one two punch of a veil of summer first mm. <laughs> to stop the counter spell. Now all yeah. my stuff can't be countered. By the way, seed time. <laughs> extra, <laughs> extra turn. Uh, so <laughs> cast this ultimate this. <laughs> So do you think people should, let's say they have a play group that's like ours, where you got, uh, you know, a few normal people, and you got one control player that's usually going to have, <laughs> not every week, but usually going to have. Normal people, the control <laughs> player. <laughs> Just right. Right. normal for once. <laughs> but, but you, uh. Screaming. But you know what I'm trying to say. Like, do you think there's any, like, is it consistent enough to play? Like, should we play seed time in our play group? How often do you think we'll actually get extra turn with it? Like. Or is it just a meme? Against Krim? Like, if Krim's it's, playing, uh, yes. like, our normal playgroup, like, would you play it in our playgroup and expect it to work? If Krim's not at the table, I would say some. I would say no. <laughs> okay. But, I mean, I mean, if Krim's at the table, it kind of, it almost feels, like, easy to, to get yeah, it. It's only doing your turn. But it does have to be. Sure I know, easy, but Krim actually. wants to counter my stuff. I'll just That's, keep casting oh, to well, or whatever. It's probably good for Tomer, yeah. If you put in a green artifact deck, <laughs> yeah. then yeah, I, I will count. Like, I don't care who it is. If you're playing an artifact deck, I will yeah. counter you. Like, I, like, I'm already playing a green deck because I'm playing seed time, so right, now this right. is just added insurance. <laughs> so now it's, it's like, like it. I'm baiting you into it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's true though. Counter my green spells, Krim. I'm casting a Nissa. It's uh, I, I, I. What? What can I do? I will usually <laughs> see red if if it's legit a green deck or an artifact deck. So you will probably bait me with this every time. Uh, but <laughs> no, but, you're not seeing red. It's a green deck. Oh yeah, I'm seeing it's green, which is worse. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, like I, I do think though that I don't know. You'll get the turn. You'll get the turn. How good it is is the thing. Because it's also Rebecca Gay art, and it's like I, I have I oh, have this card in paper. Uh, I have like an ugly, I have a beat up foil version of it, and I wanted to get one, but then the price went up. <laughs> but yeah, I have a lot of Rebecca it's Gay foils. Be, and I'm that's blaming how, why Seth. I know this card exists. I'm blaming Seth for that because he like tweeted about it. <sighs> that, uh, like, was, uh, that was a couple years while back. Ago. He tweeted about it. I think no, it's it's an old border foil. It's a rare, <laughs> and it's never been reprinted before. So old border foils like right. pandemic. <laughs> At the beginning of the pandemic, they all just went up. They all went up. Like it, even there was just, there I just, was just I just like blame buyout, Seth though. whenever <laughs> oh. whenever car, whenever a card spikes. I'm like, okay, here's the two things I've learned. If I played something so, on, like, it's like, need one. I, what did I, Seth tweet about today? Let's go read his Twitter. <laughs> I, oh, you did it today? I, no, 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 this was no, like no. two years ago. I think this yeah. one oh, okay. might actually be Command Zone's fault. I think Command Zone did like an underrated cards episode, exactly. and this got a shout out. So I think Ooh, I, I blame yeah. them for this one. I mean, the, the two Rebecca people I look at, Seth, and what what did Command Zone tweet? Yeah, what did, did what Command did Zone talk about it? Okay. Wow. Uh, 
I, Fine. Thanks, Dad. Does, does, does this kind of and C- command zone. E- CDH play? No. Oh, I don't think this is any play. Really? I, Actually, you know what? It's not great for two mana. Maybe. Who knows? For two Maybe mana, if you're like mono green. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It kind of... There's some win more cards, and this is like a lose a bit less card, because it kind of <laughs> implies that your spell have been countered or something. It was like... Oh, at least I get another turn. Phil yeah. just coined that I, right now. I'm curious to see if it ever <sighs> works. You, you, you've heard of the win more, but have you heard of the lose less? <laughs> My dock side got counter, but at least I can take an extra turn yeah. now. <laughs> so what you're Play. saying is, this is Copium, the card. <laughs> okay, cool. Got it. Extra turn, pay for Mystic Remora, <laughs> pass. <laughs> hey, Slugger. Don't spend it all in one place, all yeah. right? Take that yeah. turn, there buddy. Are like, there are like 28 <laughs> lands, so it's not like they're going to hit a land drop on their exit <laughs> turn. They're just going to pass and cry. It, it might not even be a rampant growth. Oh, God. No. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the most glorious cantrip you've ever cast. The heart nice, though. All right. Um... What do we got? What do we, we want? I, uh, so you got one more for us? I, I do. I, I kind of have two somewhat related cards. I want to know what yeah, Grim yeah. thinks about this archetype of card, which is uh, taxing effects. Things that tax spells in specific. So card number one, uh, easy one. Thalia Guardian of Thraben. Two drop, uh, human. It's a legend. And it makes non-creature spells cost one more to cast. It's a 2-1 with first strike. So that's number one. Number two is Wandering Archaic, which... I don't know if you would think of this as a control hate card, but I it's a five mana four four that says whenever an opponent casts an instant or sorcery spell, they may pay two. If they don't, you get to copy that instant or sorcery spell and choose new targets. So essentially, you counter someone. If you don't pay two mana, I get to copy the counter spell, and I can just counter your counter with the copy of the counter, and my thing resolves. How salty are these for the control player, Krim? Me as a person, I love these cards. The control <laughs> player in me, uh, I... I it's miserable, right? Like it, the if your whole deck is non-creature spells, and I'm paying one more for this, <laughs> you're not you're making all my turns inefficient. You you are push like pushing me back to like about a turn to maybe even two turns. So uh, the, these cards, I think, are like about a like a probably a four because they're on a body on top of that. So you're not only having a threat now that's punching me, my planeswalkers. You're pushing me back a little bit. This is this I think is like way better than like a seed time because I mean outside of the meme, like you're you're putting a clock on me. You're you're progressing the board, and you're taxing me, right? Like like oh my god, this is like everything you want. A clock, a player removal, if you would, and then the tax. So this is probably if there. I I personally hate Veil of Summer, but if I were to tell you what are what's the actual best way to probably attack a control player deck, it's these cards because you're literally attacking them and you're taxing them, so you're hitting them on multiple fronts. And I'll go ahead. Counter Turner. offer though. <laughs> Counter offer though. You're also pissing off the rest of the table too. Yeah, well, you know, backfire. you can't. You, <laughs> you know, not everyone's gonna love you <laughs> because a lot of people aren't. A lot of people when they when they look at a taxing effect, they're not like. Who does this hurt the most? Am I getting a net gain out of this? <laughs> They're looking at, well, you made my rampant growth cost one more. Well, you I hate you. I <laughs> deserve it. <laughs> I'm going to kill you. Yeah. Well, I mean, you make my, I don't know, my Demir Signet cost <laughs> one more. I hate you. So it's like, They're yes, They're, like, They're the worst it could. At the it, table. Kill them. <laughs> yeah. It, it could affect the, the control player much more and therefore actually improve your odds of winning. But because people don't actually think about it that way, they will prob they might they might gang up on you on that one. They'll be like, I hate you for the Stalia. I'm either gonna spend my removal to kill it ASAP or I'm gonna attack you because you made my Demir signal <laughs> cost one more. But you've got so five was That's with the thing, the like cake. And like mm. like the archaic is it's also a beefy yeah. body. Like the thing is, like you yeah, can true. you can gang up on these people, but the difference between them and like let's just say a control player, control player is nothing. Their face is wide open. The bodies <laughs> actually it's will so block punchable. you. <laughs> like they will throw hands. They will yeah. throw hands. I like the archaic the most, honestly. Like that one is like it doesn't tax anybody, so they're like fine. But then if the control player is just like I want to cast a counter spell, but now I have to pay two extra, or else you just counter it right back. 
Yeah. Secretly, that's so good. Uh, these and, lights... and you're punching them in the face with a six-six. Yeah. Six? Well, that, that's exactly why I think these, like even Thalia, I think you may look at it as like you're taxing the table, but these cards allow, I think, you to be actually pretty aggro, because yeah. oftentimes it's hard to be an aggro deck at a th- like you know when you have 120 life to work through and like 300 other cards to like worry about, right? So. These cards delaying the whole table allows you to actually be aggressive. Or you could stacks, I guess. But, like, I think these cards are better when you're just super punching everyone out of the game. And I also just really like that the floor is pretty high. One of the things I worry about with the boils and seed times and those narrow cards is just, like, sometimes they're going to be really bad to uncastable. Worst case with Wandering Archaic, I mean, it's a 5-mana 4-4. Four four. Like, that's not great, and someone might cast a spell. So even if you end up at a table with no control decks, you're not going to be completely embarrassed to have Wandering Archaic in your deck. When if you're playing some other cards, you're going to be very, very sad that you have, like, literally just did that draw that you hit. Yeah. yeah, and everybody runs some amount of instant sorcery. You yeah. don't have any control. Like, yeah. you just have whatever. You get like an extra sword off it or something. I, I don't know. N- I never see Wondering Archaic, though. I, I remember there was I, like I so play. hyped when it came out, and I just never, I never see anyone play it on Commander Clash for some reason. I've I seen did. it on stream a I couple did. times, and it's usually like political. Like, people are like, hey, would you like to double up on your sword and we can take out two things? It's like, oh. hey, yeah, yeah, I would. It was cool. It's that pretty cool, actually. Oh. Yeah, we should play this card more, I think. Yeah, I think, so. <laughs> I think it's good. I forgot I, about it. It technically has a backside, too, that I didn't read, because I don't think anyone ever <laughs> no. casts it. But there, they, it, do, it does do something if you cast the backside. <clears throat> I don't uh, think they reveal top five. Uh, Each player reveals top card of the library, top five cards, until they reveal a land and or an instant sorcery card among them. So you can get a land and an instant sorcery, or none. Um, and then you put that into your hand, and each player gains three life. That's pretty group huggy. So it's group huggy. Very group huggy. Like net loss for you, but like if you really need a land, I guess. If you're you desperate for like a wrath, you're about to die, like everyone dig for a yeah. wrath or something. I guess I could see there being some situations where I cast it, but I think the big payoff's the the wandering archaic side for sure. Wait, wait, okay, one one question. If you're a red deck, do you just like throw in a pyroblast or is that worth it? Pyroblast is red instant, uh counter target. Uh, blue spell or blow up a blue permanent? CDH. Is that worth it? CDH, yes, obviously. But, like, strictly talking casual commander, how good is just countering one spell and or blowing up one blue permanent? Because I feel like... Sending a message. (laughs) So sending the message, yes. Second, but, like, (laughs) like if you're talking about efficiency in your deck, you're trying to one-for-one a deck that loves one-for-oneing. Right, that's like if I played I played a miser duress so I can try to rip your thought seize from your hand, you know? Like it's like mm, yeah. I don't I don't know if I like that, right? Like to be honest with you. So, I think it's just not great cuz like it might get your one win con through, but I I'd rather just play like an overturn even at this point a card we'd mention. Yeah, so I, not very it's not proactive this? enough. I I I don't like yeah. it enough to be honest with you. Because you're not you're not a control deck, right? So why are you 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 could play this in a red based control deck, sure. But if you're like an, a a non control deck just trying to get on board, do things. I don't think this is proactive in helping your game plan. I don't play it. I played in CDH where yeah, I think either. winning the counter war is worth it. But at our yeah. pl- power level, I don't think it's worth a slot. I'd rather. I don't know, play a Ragavan and start drawing cards or something that generates card advantage. <laughs> like, I think yeah. that would be a better technique at our power level. Correct. Fair. It's cool, so, though. So zero, zero, like, to one on the salt zero scale. Zero salt. Not much. Okay. You're not getting many sad crims from this one. <laughs> You'd get probably nice. <laughs> there, that's pretty cool. Yeah. There's one, well done. There's one other card I noticed on your list, Homer, that I was curious Okay. It was there. It was a stranglehold, a four manner enchantment that says your opponents can't search their libraries. If an opponent would begin an extra turn, that player skips that turn instead. Is that like targeted extra turn hate? Basically, is that the how it hates yeah. on blue? I mean, it hates it hates on anybody searching their library, so it shuts off fetch lands. It's basically like an opposition agent, except it doesn't have flash, and you don't get the card. But it kind of just sits there. And if your opponents are like an extra turn deck, then that's that's almost GG for them. Like, let's say you're like yeah. you're against Narset extra turns. Um, 
their deck is full of extra turn spells. So if they can't cast their extra turns, then and they can't search for a removal spell for the stranglehold, then they're kind of dead in the waters. Like I know most Narset decks are like ninety percent of their extra whatevers or extra turns, and they have like one or two extra combats. Mm-hmm. Because extra turns are just way better than extra combats. So if you're like an extra turn dot deck, you drop a stranglehold, odds are they they are out of the game and you have like a, many turns to deal with them f- for I, for sure. They have to like naturally draw into so a yeah, removal spell for the it. The one extra turns player is gonna give this like a thirty out of like yeah. five like salty <laughs> crims, right? Yeah. But, but like well, right But like the problem here is again much like so, in, like one of the episodes we just had this season, there are enchantments and things that you play on the board that's actually helping the control player or the tempo deck. Right? Like mm. Phil played the painful quandary this past season, and that played right into my game plan of being aggro. It gave yeah. me a way to kill people faster. Seth so killed himself. Yeah, like and Seth, Seth <laughs> died because of it from a notion <laughs> that he <laughs> lashed in. Right, like he was at one. Yep. Right, so so that's why when like there are things that you just may not want to play because you may actually be helping the control player. So this is one of those things where, uh, on average, a majority of people do tutor. But if you're trying to shut down tutors, I think there's better ways than a four mana sorcery spend my turn to do it. Right? Like, for, that's... probably makes green angriest. Like, yeah, right. They're like, no yeah. for growth, yeah. ravel, ravel, ravel. Right, right. You're making the green player angry. The control player is like, well, you know, all you're doing is slowing down the game, which is what we want. Right? You're the blue True. outside of an extra turns deck. All you've done is slow down the game for everyone that isn't the blue deck. So I actually think this is like a zero on the salt scale, except for your, the extra turns player. They're gonna they're gonna like probably never play with you again. Fair. You can play it in green, uh, in blue, right? To prevent the opponent from seat timing. Yeah. Oh, there you, there you go. go. New, is we're we're entering the seat time meta. <laughs> yeah, this is where we out meta ourselves. <laughs> okay, all right, cool. <laughs> Mm. This is why Dwari disruption is so good, by the way, because once you once you counter the first spell, they see time and then you Dwari disruption them and you don't have the one. <laughs> oh, the one layers, son. layers, mm. and then you Zoff consumption them out. <laughs> sure, surely green won't have like an extra it. mana to pay for anything, you know, just not the green no. way. No, that would be silly. What are they, a white deck? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, we went over a bunch of uh, uh, cards that we think... Oh, yeah, Krim. Before, if, if we're going to conclude it, can I just mention there's one thing... I, I'd mentioned the stacks earlier is a really good way to dunk on blue, but there's one mm-hmm. more thing that I think is it has been left out. Yes. It's, it's probably better than Uncounterable. It's Grand Abolisher, Dragonlord uh, Dramoka... Oh, we didn't mention those. ...and Defense yeah. Grid. And be- why? Because these cards are exactly anti-blue. This is the best thing. Like, I know I hate Veil of Summer, but that's a me thing, right? But I-, I will say, on average, the best thing you can do is these kind of effects. Because their whole deck is instant speed. If they do it on their turn, it doesn't matter. Counter spells are literally bad. They are, like, unplayable. Stone unplayable. Unless, you know, you're countering their spells. Uh, like, they're, you're casting your spells on their turn, right? So, anything that shuts them off. For example, this is kind of going hand-in-hand hand with, like, the tax thing. Defense Grid makes it so that people have to pay three more to cast spells not on their turn. It's a two-mana artifact. Any deck can play it. This is the perfect thing against a blue deck. I think the, these cards are totally fine. Like, I don't feel like any of these are, like, BM or, like, you know, above the power level of a casualty. I think, it, like, a, you could play a defense grid. I think you could play Dramoka, Dragon Lord, or Grand Arbor. These are really good cards for shutting down the blue player. Any blue player. Because they all function at instant speed. So, it, any any varying flavor of it, you want some, I think, some effect like this. And... Again, what is the one thing we've preached over and over? Control wants to outvalue you and get ahead on board or card advantage and stuff like that. But this is putting a body on the board. Dragonlord Dramoka has a 5-7 body. You may not think it, but Grand Abolisher being human, a 2-2, that's better than the control player has nothing. So I'm just saying these are bodies backed by an ability that will win you the game. Yeah. Except for defense. I will... So defense grid, I'm a little bit less hot on just because if there's a combo player at the table and you drop down a defense grid, then they get to combo off for free. So I'm a little bit afraid of that. But I like Grand Abolisher. Grand Abolisher is during your turn, your opponents can't cast spells or activate abilities or artifacts, creatures, or enchantments. So you're basically saying 
your opponents can get countered. That's fine. And when that benefits you because you're making the control player waste resources countering other people's stuff. That's problem. awesome. Yeah, but on my turn, you're not countering my things or you're not blowing up my things or you're not fogging yeah. me or whatever. So I think Grand Abolisher is just like... And, and Jermoke is really good too. I think those are my top two by far. Like Grand Abolisher just throwing it into a random white deck. Yeah. Like you're just saying like if I'm a combat focused deck, you're not going to be... You're not going to be fogging me, you know. You're not going to be fogging me out or anything. And abilities. You're not going to be aetherizing me, you know. And you can't counter my stuff, you know. It's so. sh- shutting down abilities, and most importantly, it's two mana. Dragon yeah. Lord Jamoka is seven, so uh, it is a bit six. of a cost. Six or, actually, oh, six, but six, still, yeah, six. six. But it's a bit higher on the curve. However, it is uncounterable, which is another thing we've touched up on. So it is kind of yeah. nice that it's uncounterable, and obviously, it's going to resolve. So if it resolves, that turn is yours. And it's a five seven flying light right. flank, so just it's six max people in the face. Yeah, for five. And tr- Woo. Yeah, we should oh, probably play. One. Should probably play more of that. <laughs> Dragon Lord <laughs> Mocha is really good. Like the life link makes it good if you're low on life, and it beats a control deck. So yeah, it's I a like five seven, oh, wait, right? right? Like it's a good body. Yeah, I guess. I guess there's one more thing I want to shout out to because we do have this is an honorary fill for the fill salt. <laughs> Uh, I know it's a Crim Salt scale, but this is for the Phil Salt scale. So, so blue, a common finisher for blue is stealing other people's permanence, the blatant thievery effects, expropriate effects, agent of treachery effects. Stealing stuff is like one of the best ways of kind of being removal because you take away the permanent, but you also get to use it against them. So two ways of dealing with that. One, first one, it goes into any deck, Homeward Path. It's a land, it's has for colorless. And you can tap it. Each player gains control of all creatures they own. This actually also hoses uh, black decks too. Because if they're reanimator and they can steal your opponent uh, creatures from an opposing graveyard, like a rise from the Dark Realms or whatever. Ooh. Or I guess reanimate, Ooh. animate dead, yeah. all that stuff. Homeward Path is like, thank you for reanimating my creature for me. Uh, it's now on my side. I'm going to kill you with it. And in Blade and Thievery, same thing. Same thing. If you steal my creature, I'm just going to steal it right back, which is great. It's also yeah. pretty good against Insurrection as well. And yeah, Insurrection. Yeah, because you can do it at instant speed. And it's a land. It's color. It's attached for colorless. It enters the battlefield on tap. So I think this is really good. There's one, though, that I think is underrated. Uh, and it's Brand. This is a red instant. And unlike Homeward Path, which only affects uh, creatures and gives it to your opponents, too. Like, if if, uh, if somebody does, like, a, a Rise from the Dark Realms, uh, you're giving back your opponent's creatures as well. This one, brand instant gain control of all permanents you own. So if it's, if somebody blatant thievery steals your land or enchantment or whatever, you're getting all that stuff back anyway. Um, and you're not helping your opponents at the same time either. But the nice thing here is it has cycling too. So it's not always going to be relevant. But when it's relevant, it's really high impact. But when it's not relevant, you can just cycle away for two mana. So if you're dealing with theft effects, be it blue or black, I think brand is like an easy thing to slot in. It's four bucks, so it's not like super expensive or anything. And the worst case scenario is you pay two mana to draw a different card instead. So I think I think this card is kind of slept on as like a way to kind of deal with blue and black decks. I don't know uh, if I like audience. this card. You don't like yeah. it? I like it. This one is way like this is on the same level of like seed time. Yeah, I, but yeah. the it doesn't do anything. <laughs> it doesn't do anything against Krim, but it's good against Phil. Like I think it, it goes against a different kind of blue player. Like Krim isn't really so much of the thieving style of blue player as much as the like rapping and countering no. blue player. But against Phil decks, I think that those cards are really good. <laughs> I mean, well, Krim, Krim plays, plays like Gonzi and Evelyn. I do, yeah. yeah. but but yeah. Phil is agent. like. <laughs> Theft, yeah, like, like ramped up, right? Like I do yeah. a, a good amount of theft. So, Krim, you own just, an Evelyn deck. Oh yeah, like, hey, oh fully, yeah. fully. I I love my theft, but but Phil is like, yeah, fifty true. times me amplified when it comes to theft. <laughs> so, but well, Phil is a blue player in that sense. Oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah. So, I, but I, even with that in mind, Brand does not. See, the fact is I am using a card slot, whereas Homeward Path is just a land slot that I could just easily replace with, right? Like, it still produces mana. It still it. does something. But it's two mana to cycle, first off. And, 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 like, on top of that, at this point, why not just actually play, like, a cantrip, right? Like, why not play a preordain, mm. a ponder, a brainstorm, or, or a faithless looting, or, or, or whatever, right? Because this 
is going to just oftentimes be a pay two mana draw card. Random one, by the way. Yeah, but when it when it's not pay two mana draw card, it wins you games. Like this is the best <laughs> card in my Porphyro deck, for example, because my Porphyro deck just plays a bunch of fatties. Just just sure. fat things, sneak attacks them out, and audit, my worst matchup is like just a black or a blue deck that steals my creatures, especially a black one. Like black decks that like just steal creatures from graveyards and play puts them into play for for cheap. That just beats my deck down. But brand, when I have brand. It's just it's a free win at that point. Like I just take all of them at instant speed, and then on my turn I attack you and I kill you. I so mean, that's why it's so worth it for me. And then two, if it's not worth it, I just spend two mana and I draw a card, whatever. I just feel to like ice. this is like the hundred and first card, maybe even the hundred and fifth yeah. <laughs> card. That's the problem. We only can yeah. have a hundred cards, and like sure, there's lots of situations for it. But I feel like on average, you're better off just having any any uh, anything else <laughs> like like a faithless mm. leader unless <sighs> your deck is playing which is pretty specific and not really a toma thing if you play like a thief's auction scramble verse or like exchange okay. <laughs> control effect <laughs> yeah since it only yes. gets back you know, like if you say you, you oh, float the Oko. red and then you yeah you yeah if you play like an oko ultimate brand. and switch your creature with another creature you can brand it and get yeah have it all it's on or brand. Scrambleverse or like yeah, these options. It's in my actually Zedru deck for that reason. I don't run Scrambleverse because I'm not like <laughs> that. Wow. <laughs> brand is in my Zedru deck because I, I switch a roof things oh, yeah. all the time. Yeah. And then I get them back at instant speed. If if that okay, so yeah, obviously this card excels in those archetypes that are all about like, yeah, you know, yeah. giving you things and taking them back or something like that. Sure. Like Gilded sure, Drake yeah, and then controller. But it's still a, an archetype within blue, right? Like, there's lots of, like, switcheroo yeah. things. And in a switcheroo you deck, I You love wouldn't this. jam it just as protection. Yeah. Is what you're saying. Mm-hmm. I probably wouldn't That's either. I, I think brand is underrated, but I don't know. Is it really relevant enough against enough decks to be worth it? I'm on the fence. I don't know. I do think it's probably better than it's giving credit for, but I don't know if I would just throw it in, like, every red deck, just hoping that someone's going to steal my stuff. <laughs> Homeward Please path was steal cool. my things. <laughs> Please make this relevant. <laughs> yeah, Homeward Path is easier to just jam yeah, in. Right. I think oh, it's, it's, like it's bucked. Color. It's bucked on Magic Online, which kind of sucks. But otherwise, yeah. I think it was nearly every match we saw it, it was relevant. And not just yeah. because of I'm playing like Agent of Treachery, but uh, reanimating stuff from, as Thomas said, like there's so many ways you could need your creatures back. And nowadays, there's so much ways to steal something. I think Homeward <laughs> Path might be worth it in up to two color decks, just as an auto include. The one thing that I've always found funny, though, is that Ancient of Treachery can steal the Homeward Path. The Homeward Path. <laughs> yeah. Whereas Brand, yeah. Brand, yeah. Brand gets around Got it. him. I've played Got around him. it by playing yeah. this card that has been dead to me for the last two years, but I got you. <laughs> But also, I think Homer Path can be stolen by a lot of effects, but it's I much prefer you stealing my Homer Path than you stealing my most important creature or oh, something fully, like that. Fully. Yeah. So fully. even even in that bad situation, it's still good. Unless I'm yeah, Homer Path blinking so, Agent yes. of Treachery and then stealing everything afterwards. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is where Brain comes in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Got him. <laughs> <laughs> um Okay, so we covered a bunch of cards that can help against blue, specifically blue control. Um, blue, yeah, really? that should be a lot to think about. I think the biggest thing is probably like mentality. Like you have to have a good mentality going into it. You have to know, you know, just don't run out your best cards into open blue mana and uh, try to bait it out, try to pressure them. But if you want some an extra oomph, then some of these cards can help depending on your play group. So it's, um, it, yeah. But yeah, it's just altering yeah. your play style. That's honestly yeah. all you have to do, right? Like, just alter it a little bit, plan around some things, rather than just, oh, I'm going to rule zero this entire archetype out of the game, right? <laughs> like, I, I think that you could just play around it. I mean, look at me, an opposition agent. You got me that one time. <laughs> how much have, how much respect have I given it for the rest of the Tomer <laughs> checks for season. three Probably open mana much. Much before Maybe he goes to bed. <laughs> yeah, no. I check. I check under my bed. Oh, I, turn, I, I turn no, on the nightlight. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, when you started being afraid of dark ritual and opposition agent, that's when I think you went a little too far with your with your fear. Uh, like one black man, uh, if you're freaking out about that, I don't even know what to. I don't even know what to tell you, Tomer. I should take my own advice and not be too scared. But also, I'll be like, "Here's the rampant growth cream. You can take it if you want it." <laughs> when you game so hard, you outgame yourself. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, don't don't go as crazy as I am with opposition agent, but uh, yeah, um, mindset, play style, and then yeah, some cards to help you out. All right, everybody, that's our our show for this week. Um, thank you so much for getting to the end of it. I forgot even to plug uh, the merch stuff, but if you want to help support the channel, you can like and subscribe on wherever you're listening to this. And the other way you can support the channel is you can head on over to mtggoldfishmerch.com. You can buy playmats, deck sleeves, uh, deck boxes, uh, t-shirts, and so much more over there at mtggoldfishmerch.com. Thanks so much for reaching the hour 30 mark. Um, and until next time, friends, see ya!